I am Bryson Slothauer. I'm a teacher here at Clackamas Web Academy. And we are very lucky today to welcome Robin Cody to our classroom. He's going to be talking to us a little bit about his most recent book, Another Way the River Has, which we've been reading this semester, so we're all familiar with it. Um, Robin was born here in Oregon in Estacada and has been working off and on several different careers throughout the years, including baseball umpire, school bus driver, basketball ref, basketball ref, admissions at Reed College. Yeah. So he's got uh, lots of great experiences in, in this region that um, he can draw on for, for his writing. And um, we're going to be reading another of his works next semester, um, Ricochet River. But today we're going to focus more on, on the book that we've been reading at hand, which is his collection of short stories. Um, so I will pass it over to Robin, and he will. Um, and the first thing is, uh, happy to be here. Thanks for reading my book. That's, a, that's an honor. And uh, I've never had a bad time here at CWA. I really like uh, to come here because you guys are out there getting your uh, feet muddy. Your, uh, you know the smell of, of uh, spawning salmon now, don't you? Uh, you're out there in it. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm glad you, um, you read the book, that you've prepared the questions, and stuff like that. So let's just start that way. Who's going to be uh, the first to read here? Yep. You're going to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe say your name before you start. My name is Mary, and uh, the passage that I picked was on page 18 in Turtle, because I thought it was pretty interesting. It was. I don't know when he did it, whether he wrote the message that night or visited St. Helens in the meantime, but in the Turtle's log, the next time I opened it was a message from Sam, to me, from Sam. He had seen how I loved the boat, in a celebration of his birthday, he had decided to give it to me. And I thought that was pretty cool, and I wondered how it made you feel to ride, to drive the turtle for the first time, knowing it was yours, and how excited you was to know the boat was yours. Oh, man, it gave me chills. Just, <laughs> just the idea that a guy for his birthday would give me the boat. Um, and Sam's a guy, he's just like that, you know? Uh, he actually enjoys building a boat more than having a boat. So we shared it that first summer. Uh, and then he saw how I use it all practically every weekend, was out there uh, way more than he used it. And so, yeah, it was a beautiful moonlit night. Um, we were coming back, four of us, my wife, his wife, coming back from the Washington side of the river, uh, the moon puddled in the, in the wake of the thing. It was just a beautiful night. And I didn't read that message to me that night. It was, it was the next day or the next time out I read that passage. It was really, it was really good. That's neat. Yeah, yeah. Also neat, uh, Sam was, he knew he was going to die of a form of leukemia. And he chose the Oregon uh, assisted uh, suicide, physician assist assisted suicide, so that when he could no longer get out of bed, uh, he said, okay, that's it. Um, and he died in his own bed, uh, gave me half the ashes, and we put the ashes at the confluence of Willamette and Columbia River. and. Everybody who had a Sam McKinney made boat came and we told stories, told stories about Sam. So he was, he was that kind of friend. Really, yeah, good guy. Thank you, Mary. Okay, who's up? Do you actually pass the microphone? Pass it. You picked the direction. Yeah, I picked the direction. Yeah, good. Okay, so my name is Sam, and the passage I chose to read was from Killed on the Woods, or Killed in the Woods, on page 63, 
and it is a tree topper has to be strong and athletic, cool enough to apply a power saw at dizzying heights, and quick enough to counter gusts of wind while at work. He doesn't have to be a deep thinker, deep thinker, but he must be brash and decisive. It doesn't hurt if he likes to be the center of attention. John Keller combined all those traits, but his career as a topper started backwards. He began by falling. Yeah, uh, tell the camera how he fell. Did it kill him or what? Um, I mean, just tell the camera what happened to John there. No, it didn't. He didn't die when he fell. Uh, first time he fell, he fell 90 feet, but somehow he survived. Yeah, and the way he survived was because he was stoned. He was so relaxed, he was so relaxed that he fell that 90 feet and bounced. Uh, it certainly should have killed him. And he had tried in other ways, uh, not tried, but he was just, he was just doomed. Uh, he drove a motorcycle into the back of a school bus for Pete's sake. He was just a, just a wild man. Uh, and then he grew up. Um, to be a responsible uh, person. He quit drinking. He quit uh, whatever else he was, he was doing, uh, accepted Jesus Christ into his life. Uh, and for him, that was, that was a big deal. So he was a classmate of mine that uh, was, worth, was worth following to see how he would kill himself. <laughs> These are true stories, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay to laugh in here. <laughs> okay, who's next? Who's up? Good. Okay, my name is Isaac, and I chose a passage on page 44. But where time is fluid, space needs definition. I need a place. I wanted to anchor myself someplace in the maze of islands upstream from Kaklamet on the Washington side of the river at Klatskani, Oregon. The ideal spot would have a sandy beach with a deep enough pitch the turtle would stay at afloat at low tide. Avoid the ship channel where the best beaches are. Shelter from the northwest wind would be good, as would a far-reaching view. The shelter and view often preclude one another. I poked around for a few days trying this place and that, experimenting with various anchorages. None were quite right. Okay, that's finding a place uh, to be alone for four days at a time. Uh, you've seen a picture of the turtle. Uh, there's no store nearby. I want to be where I'm not hearing civilization except when a plane goes over or maybe a log truck across the river on Highway 14. So purposefully uh, trying to find a place where I could just anchor uh, until the ice melts in the cooler or I run out of food and have to go into Klatsk and I uh, to, to resupply. Um, so the advantage of having the turtle like that is that you get up at daybreak without disturbing any of the animals around. The animals get curious about the boat. So uh, that one scene where a little baby beaver, a kit, uh, with I don't know if it was mom or dad, but I, I'm going to call her mom, all right? The two of them come around, and the beaver had been making rounds right at daybreak anyway. That's what they do. Uh, they're not out in the daytime. Uh, so right before sunup even, but daybreak, uh, here comes mom and a little kit. And on other mornings, the mom had gone out of her way to avoid the boat. But the little kit this time saw the boat and went right to it. Kids are, kids are curious, you know? And mom went right after him and nipped him and pulled him away. Like, it was, it was just like your little sister who does, uh, does something really foolish and dangerous, uh, which was fun to see that, that there's some teaching going on with, uh, with beavers, uh, just like with us humans. It was kind of stuff like that you can't see. If I pulled in by motor, uh, man, uh, the herons would be 
gone, the beaver, the raccoon, everything. So that was an advantage just as a viewing place. Good passage, thank you. Yeah. I chose the passage on Highway Slow, the, on page 53. Maybe it's all right to let the river get the upper hand like this. The world is, the world is good. It means us no harm, but a mind can wander too far from itself. That's probably as good as a reason as any for the towns and city, cities where people can forget how large the world is. A man wants to stay out here as long, only so long. Wow, did I write that? <laughs> uh, yeah, we like to get away from the city during the time. Uh, I, live, I live right in town, pretty close to uh, uh, Reed College on 34th Avenue. So it's, it's all uh, pavement and uh, roads and houses and stuff like that. And sure, we have parks. But to get away, to get out of it, uh, really slows you down, thinks of other way. And then you start getting a little bit spooked about how large the world is. The stars are, uh, because there's no ambient light around at night, the stars, man, it's just, yeah, it just makes you think sometimes too much, <laughs> too big for you. Yeah. Um, I don't have my book with me today, so I can't read. Um, but I had a question. Um, which which river do you prefer more, the Clackamas or Sandy? Oh man, that's like saying which uh, which of my kids do I like best, or uh, something like that. They're different, so different. The Clackamas. The Clackamas is like that riffle and pool and riffle and pool. Uh, it's not an adventure to go out there. It's a place you can fall out of the canoe and just swim along with it uh, for a while. And that's, that's what I grew up with, inner tubes and, uh, and the Clackamas. Uh, so I will always like that. Um, the Willamette. Uh, was part of my growing up too because dad was a fisherman and we fished right below the falls uh, for salmon. It's called hog line fishing. Um, oh, that story didn't make the book, did it? Uh, but yeah, uh, there was the Willamette for fishing and then the Columbia. I spent 82 days solo canoe trip on the Columbia River and made a book out of it. It's called Voyage of a Summer Sun. Going to the, the river actually comes bubbling up out of the ground up in Canada. Uh, and you can put a canoe in up there and take it all summer, 82 days solo, uh, to, uh, to the ocean. So Voyage of a Summer Sun was that. And so I have a different kind of feel for the Columbia. Not that I grew up there, but you discover stuff uh, with that much time alone on the river. Yeah, good question. Jeez. Uh, my name is Mackenzie, and I chose, chose a passage from page 166. While David so happy guards his ancient, ancient tradition in his defiant little net, while Le Wayne Lewis flies off for a summit meeting, while Jack Swartz polishes his lonely outreach for yet, <coughs> sorry, for yet another in a series of Indian trials that will last well into the summer. A deep sadness settles over the Riverside Forum. All we're doing, says Tom Gibbon, the guy in the orange ball cap, formerly with the sheriff off, sheriff's office, is fighting over who gets the last fish. And my question was, how did you come to know if David's so happy? Oh, good question. Uh, David So Happy was in the news at that time because he'd been arrested uh, for fishing. Uh, and here's a guy whose ancestors made a living at fishing. And not just a living. Fishing was their lifestyle. It was their equivalent of 
church. It was a spiritual thing to be on the river, uh, to honor the salmon. Uh, I was particularly curious about David So Happy, first of all, because I loved the name. How can you not like a guy uh, who is David So Happy? And it's a whole family uh, on the river that, that shares that name. Um, the news had been that a bunch of Indians got arrested by the federal government. There was a sting operation where the government caught these people selling fish out of season. Uh, so they set up a whole, well, you read the story, right? Has everybody read this story or am I? Uh, yeah, I think so. So that was particularly interesting to me. Here's a guy who by treaty, 1855 treaty, when the Euro-Americans, we, got out here and really basically took over ownership of the land in return for, for a promise. We promised the Indian people that they could always fish in the usual places. They could always hunt uh, on the land. They could always dig their roots like they do. That's the equivalent of their potatoes. Um, and the berries. They could always, you know, they could always use the land. But then what happens with dams? The fishing places disappear. You got reservoirs instead of falls. Salilo Falls, the big, big fishing place falls, is underwater. So the Indians really got messed with. Uh, and they had no choice. Uh, the U.S. Army was, was convening the Indian tribes and stuff. Uh, so I was always interested in that, partly because my mom was interested in the history of Oregon, not just the pioneers, but how people lived here uh, before we did. Uh, so it was a natural thing to be interested in David, uh, and the more I saw of him, uh, the more I respected him. He, uh, he lived in a shack alongside the river um, with law books, United States law books lined up there. He'd been studying the law and the, uh, and the treaty. Uh, he's a bright guy. Uh, he's kind of, well, he's, he's good looking in an Indian sort of way. He's all wrinkled. Uh, has his hair, hair in long braids. Uh, very, very smart guy about his right to be fishing there. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting not just to tell the David So Happy story, but find out from the government, what the hell were they doing out there? Why go after this guy? Uh, and then the more I learned about that, uh, the more I got to writing the story, here's what the fish narc says, here's what David so happy, and both of them exaggerate in that story. Uh, so I'm not the judge in there. I'm, not, I'm letting them, uh, well, I let the government guy sort of hang himself, you know, with what he has to say. Uh, and David so happy too. I didn't correct him if I knew he was exaggerating. So that's where, that's where the story came from, and it was first published in the Oregonian here. There used to be a pullout magazine in the Oregonian, and that's where very early in my writing career, uh, I, I hadn't written any books yet. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. That's, uh, that's a big one for me, yeah. I'm Tyler, and I chose Patches from page 18. So. Do we need Tyler to speak up a little bit? Is it? Great. That she's flat bottom is also the turtle's major drawback. This boat gets hammered in rough water. Three foot waves are common at St. Helens when the wind howls. Instead of cutting through the waves, she bangs into them one at a time. I rattle my feelings a time or two getting back to the marina from beach picnics. Yeah, that's true. Um, usually if you're going out on the river, you go out in the morning because the water's flat. 
And so the challenge is uh, with a flat bottom boat to get back to St. Helens uh, where, it, where it stays, where it sleeps. Um, most river going boats or on big river like that, the Columbia, have a V-shaped bottom or almost a V-shaped bottom so they cut through uh, the chop of the waves. But this one had a flat front and a flat bottom so it really uh, did, it failed to cut through there uh, and was, yeah, kind of like canoeing uh, where if you don't have enough weight in the canoe, it's not going to cut through the chop. Um, and that was, there were a lot of things to like about that boat, including uh, you could sleep on it, uh, including it was kind of queer looking, uh, that people would stare at it. Um, and I was kind of proud of being different out there. It just fit with the, the land, I thought. So, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, good. My name's Claire. Um, my passage is from If Salmon Were, Tr sorry, If Salmon Were Truth, page 166. 1984, when the mighty Columbia lay low with a heart condition and a hangnail, the government went after the hangnail, its Indian fisherman with a sledgehammer. Wow, read that again, would you? 1984, when the mighty Columbia lay low with a heart condition and a hangnail, the government went after the hangnail, its Indian fisherman with a sledgehammer. God, that's good, don't you think? <laughs> Man. Okay, the Columbia is laid low as if it's a person. It's got a heart attack, it's got a hangnail, okay? So instead of going over, going on to the real problem, which is the dams, how the blood gets through out to the body and everything, the, the things people have done to the river, they go, off the, they go after the easy target. You know, we'll, we'll go after the Indians, we'll even blame it on them that they're part of the problem for the fish disappearing. Um, Thank you for reading that because do you ever have a, an idea just fly out the window that you got something to say and what was it? Uh, I will maybe think of it in a minute. No, it's truly gone. It's truly gone. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I'm Grace and I chose a passage from Page 78. That's it, he said. That's just it. A river has its own ideas. What we see of a river is not ours to choose. Yeah. Uh, that's from a situation where the, the turtle got in an accidental place because we'd gone up a tributary from the Columbia uh, to visit a guy. Uh, tide went out from under us and we're stuck up there. So we went back out to the Columbia. Uh, it was dark by the time we got there and couldn't quite see, but there was this abandoned dock and we tied the two boats up to it. And in the morning, the tide had gone out again and both boats were at an angle like this because it, it was on a sandbar, actually a mud bar. Um, so we were stuck there at daybreak. We would have left but we couldn't. And because we hadn't moved, here comes all the wildlife together. Uh, man, the beaver diving underneath the dock. We had the herons. We had, uh, well, you could imagine all the, little, all the little bubbles that come up through the mud at Tideline. Have you, have you seen that before? Uh, you imagine there's all those little, um, filtering things and little teeny jaws down there making a living in the mud. Uh, how can you not think about that? Uh, and so that's the kind of, that's the kind of situation uh, that really got me. Can I read a passage? Um, can I read my favorite passage from that? Stop me if I'm cutting somebody off here.
wisps, wisps, <laughs> wisps of vapor danced across the river and the songbirds were just a-going it. I walked back to the net mining platform, newly attuned to an orgy of life and death at the threshold, that is, the threshold where water meets land. Life at the border between water and land is richer than elsewhere. All along the wet mud bar were tiny air holes for little breathers taking on tinier fuel. Here in the back and forth wash of salt and fresh water, noiseless mouths and claws and filters were at work on the business of life. An aroma of rich rot filled the still air as the sun broke over the ridge to the east, powering up the whole haunting and wondrous system. And I'm going to skip ahead because I walked down the dock and up a plant plank ramp to the dike. Two farmhouses held the high ground. At sea level behind the dike, lush hay grew between irrigation ditch. At the top of the dike ran a one-lane road paved, and I walked upstream until a shaft of sunlight hit a big gray doe, a mule deer, at the woods line. She stood frozen, watching me, watching her. A short yellow school bus took on children at a farmhouse, and I walked back to the dock thinking my heart might break. What is it? Morning sun lights up an unstartled deer. Children step into a yellow school bus. The wild and the human commingle here in an astonishing array of survival packages. I'd read somewhere that, I'm, that I am 70-something percent water, H2O. The human body, by volume, is mostly water. So a kid mounting a school bus, a beaver emerging for its morning rounds, a heron terrorizing gulls, these riverside willows, too, all these collections of fiber and rising sap. Each life form is just another way the river has of getting up out of its banks. That might be the best sentence I ever wrote in my whole life. Another way the river has is the title, is the title of the book. Thank you for choosing that. That's, well, you didn't, did you? I just snatched it. <laughs> Snatched it away from you. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, I'm Josie, and I chose the passage from If Salmon Were Truth on page 158. His cellmate asked for the time-honored question of all newcomers. Hey, man, what are you in for? Fishing, said David so happy. Yeah, that was just so. I mean, that's, a, that's exactly what he, what he said, to arrest somebody for fishing, to arrest a Native American, uh, for fishing just seemed so extremely wrong uh, to me, and David said it just perfectly, or he told that story. Um, yeah. Again, I had that feeling that, okay, I got something to say related to that. Oh, I hate that. Okay, maybe I'll think of it later. I'm Kylie, and I chose the passage from Another Way the River Has on page 77. Yeah. And it was, a beaver slipped under the end of the dock that was still afloat. I walked over to see where it had come from. The beaver's hole was underwater in flat mud, shaped like an air hole in oatmeal. Yeah, that's the same, that's the same section. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, you think of beavers, beavers as, as making uh, lodges. You know, like they're, they're dam makers. But down there where the tide is extreme, uh, there's, there's a six feet difference, six vertical feet difference, which makes difference from there to there on the slope. Uh, the beavers, I mean, what are they going to do? They can't uh, build a lodge on that stuff. They burrow 
into that dike that was, that was there. there. There are farmers in Klatskanai uh, who have had the tractors disappear uh, from the field because the beavers <laughs> went under from the river and, uh, and they lived down there. So, yeah, I hadn't quite thought that through, you know, that what we know about beavers is only partly true. Yeah, thank you. Okay, my name's Hope, and I have a question. Why did you call the book Another Way the River Has? Oh, uh, I think, can I ask you that now? What, what do you think? Does it have anything to do with, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say I don't want to embarrass you. I'm sorry. Uh, it's because of that sentence that we're all made of water. So all the life forms, everything. I mean, we know this now, that willow trees are made of the same uh, chemicals and mixes that we are. They're just a different life form uh, a way or a survival package is what they are, uh, and so are those little things in, the, in there. So everything, even the willow tree, is another way the river has of getting out of its banks, which seems just kind of thrilling to me uh, to know how things to know how things work that way. Well, you guys, you're seeing on your field trips and stuff like that. I mean, that's what we're studying here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. My name is Blake, uh, and I'm reading a passage on Hideaway Slow, page 44. Time on the turtle ignores the clock. River time is the slow crawl of the sun across the arc of early June sky, the sun rising upriver and falling downstream. A day begins with the twitter and quack of the birds announcing the rise of the light outside the cabin. Yeah. It's actually kind of musical. Uh, when, the, when the sun comes up, there's, uh, well, the, there's the twitter and quack of, of the birds and stuff. The, uh, kingfishers have a kind of ratchety sound to them, um, herons, herons come in with a bass and, and the percussion uh, is a woodpecker over there. Uh, and so I was, I was hearing the river uh, come alive, if you will, which is, well, that was part of the treat of being out there. You don't hear the world come alive at 34th Avenue and, and steel over there. Uh, so that, that's part of the pleasure of, of being out there. Can I ask a question? Good. What was your favorite chapter of the book? Oh, um, you know, that one, uh, to tell you the truth, has nothing to do with rivers or anything like that. It's this story about Ivory Broom on the school bus. Did you guys read that one, or were you sticking with the, do you know who Ivory Broom is? No, no, okay. That's my favorite because it was a little girl uh, on the school bus who was crippled. Uh, she had spina bifida when she was, when she was born, and so she, only half of her worked. Uh, the upper half and, and the other half didn't work. Uh, and so we were on a school bus with these other broken children, uh, and there's every reason in the world for these kids to feel sorry for themselves. And here's this little girl in a wheelchair uh, who had the, had the voice of a drill sergeant and the spirit of, uh, that just wouldn't quit. She wouldn't let anybody feel sorry for the side. Everything was funny to Ivory Broom. And she, uh, she helped me at the time as a bus driver. I had taken the drive. Uh, the job as a bus driver because I was I was kind of down. Uh, I want to get out and do something other than write. Uh, so that was my favorite. I would say, yeah, another way, another way the river has is probably probably my favorite of the river stuff. 
Yeah. Uh, but geez, if you have the time, read the one about uh, um, deaf basketball. Man, it's about refereeing <laughs> the school of the deaf against a Christian school over here. And you have to remember that they're deaf. You know, they don't hear the whistle. They don't hear, yeah. Okay, enough of that. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Yeah. Um, my name is Emma, and I was wondering what was your favorite memory from this book? Favorite memory from the book? Let me, let me think about that. The story about, uh, I think it's called The Mystery of Steelhead, um, drew from memories and made those memories better, or, or made those memories fit uh, better. So there's stuff in there like the first steelhead uh, I caught. There's, I think it's in the book, there's, there's that place in the turtle where a steelhead goes by the boat and breaks, breaks water, which steelhead don't do. It was as if, I mean, what's going on? What's going on? This is a backwater slough. Uh, you don't, and there was no reason, there was no, no bugs out. Uh, so I was trying to imagine, what the heck? Was there an otter down there below? or? Uh, what made it jump? Um, because truth to tell, it seemed like it was just showing off for me, which is, you know, that's too magic. I mean, it's not, it's not that, but it makes you think about stuff like that and pull in the memories. And then how miraculous it is that those salmon and steelhead, that they do it. We talked about beavers uh, a little bit back, that there's, there's learning, there's teaching. Those salmon, they do, the parents are dead by the time they come out of their eggs and come up. Zero teaching, zero, so how the heck? They're wired to go out to the ocean all the way back. <sighs> They lay 5,000 eggs at a time in the hope that two of them might come back and make more salmon. Uh, and they do it without any kind of parental advice. It's just, that's miraculous. That's the world we live in. Boy, so what a range of survival packages, if we're talking about that. Uh, those salmon are the total opposite in terms of how much teaching goes on and how much you're born with. I'll say it again, how much teaching you get and how much you're born with. Uh, what, a, what a range, salmon to beavers, salmon to us. Yeah. Hi, I'm Eddie, I'm picking the passage on page 23. It's true that Portland has been ahead of other rapidly growing cities in adopting land use, planning laws, saving green spaces within the city. Uh, yes, it is true that Portland's, Portland's ahead of other places. Um, there's a classmate of mine, Mike Houck, who is also in that book as the wild man in the city. Uh, he's made a career of preserving wild places in Portland, including uh, Ross Island down there. Ross Island was really trashed by a, a gravel, uh, gravel company. You've seen the big yellow trucks, Ross Island sand and gravel. They hollowed out the, uh, uh, the island to make a big lagoon in there, or not to make it, that was the result, a big lagoons so that they could crush the rock and make sand and gravel uh, and stuff. Um, and it's right in the middle of the city and it's where the heron rookery is. Uh, beavers and otters are in there. Uh, so how <laughs> goes after uh, the city elected people to say, hey look, we got to save that stuff or it's just going to go away. Uh, and how 
has become nationally famous for how to preserve what we have left of wildness in the city. Um, so I'm particularly interested in that. Uh, I think those animals got here before we did. We can, you know, we can live with them uh, rather than destroy their places. That's the end of the prepared questions, but whatever, whatever you want to talk about now. Mary, you got something? I'm trying to figure out how I should word it. I was wondering um, how cool it is to be an author. What inspired you to start writing books? Oh, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, well, I grew up with this stuff. I grew up in the Clackamas, Estacada. Um, I was a high school teacher and coach uh, for most of my adult life. And I had what I thought might be an original idea. And it probably wasn't. There probably aren't any original ideas anymore. But anyway, I got fired up about writing a fiction book. It doesn't have to be true, but it takes things that could be true. Comparing the life cycle of salmon to the life of people in a small town very much like Estacada. It has to do with a a relatively wild person, an Indian kid, 18 years old, senior in high school, okay, just appears in Calamus, is the name of the logging town. Um, and uh, he's funny and bright and athletic and everything, but he won't conform. Uh, he's probably not going to survive this place, much like the salmon that I was watching as a kid, the ones that go out to the ocean and come back were bumping up against the dam right below Estacada. They're not going to spawn. They're not going to survive. That is the best of the salmon that went out there. There are also some of those baby salmon that stayed in the mill pond, and they grow to be about that long. And if you hook one, it just kind of lays on its side and comes on in like, OK, you got me. Um, <clears throat> genetically, they're the same. The salmon that make the trip and the salmon that stay in the mill pond. So you got the big guys, the real wild ones. And so my idea was to write a coming of age story, two guys and a girl. They're your age. Um, figuring out what they're going to do with themselves um, and relate it to Indian creation myths. Like the Bible says, Genesis, how the world was created. Indian lore for this place, is, for this place that we live in uh, tells how coyote came here and made the world ready for humans. Uh, it's quite more entertaining to me to, to think of the Indian myth in terms of where I grew up and stuff like that. Uh, it's unbelievable, like Genesis, uh, funnier. Um, it's an alternative way of viewing the world. So that's why I wanted to be a writer, to, to be able to put that into Ricochet. Are, are you guys going to be here for Ricochet River? Same people? Yep. Oh my gosh. That's what we're talking about the next thing you read. Oh boy. Ask me, uh, ask me back after Ricochet River. <coughs> then, yeah. That's really what it's about, although it's, it's, I hope it's a funny, enjoyable book, mm -hmm. too. Phew. Yeah. Without giving too much away about Ricochet <clears throat> River, can you talk a bit about if there are any 
connections between another way the river has and your earlier piece of fiction, if, if there's any overlap there. And just talk a little bit about the different process of writing fiction versus nonfiction uh -huh. and how that affects your writing. Yeah, what, what Bryson is talking about is, is whether you have to tell the literal truth in your reporting. Like in that book, uh, I can't exaggerate anything that's going on in that book. Uh, I can let David so happy exaggerate or something like that, but I have to tell the truth about what David said. Fiction is different. You're going to see in Ricochet River that uh, these young people uh, have really interesting lives that are exaggeration. I hope it's believable, but it's not like my life. My life wasn't nearly that interesting. But I can make up uh, the girl, for example, as a uh, part you and part you and part you and take the qualities that I like about each of you and exaggerate a person there, Lorna, uh, in the book. I can exaggerate an Indian kid uh, because I grew up with an Indian kid, but he didn't know the coyote stories. So I figure out the coyote stories and give that to, uh, to a Norman-like character that I did grow up with. Uh, that's, that's the difference. I can't say which is uh, better at getting at the truth of, of how life is. Uh, sometimes I think fiction is better, uh, but maybe we'll talk about that after, after you read the book. Uh, it's set right here on your river. I mean, they go right past high rocks uh, in a raft. Anybody here use high rocks? <laughs> Paul, you do. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Two old farts in the room, <laughs> diving off rocks with, uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great place. <laughs> yes? So when you first started writing this book, did you know how it was going to end, or did you just kind of go along with how it was going? Ricochet River, I didn't know how it would end, and it, it took a long time for me to get it right, um, because it was, it was rejected as... Uh, I wasn't good enough as a writer yet to, to get it. This one is made up of short stories uh, that I knew pretty much how each one of them, well, no, that another way thing, I mean, that's, it's a surprise at the end. I didn't know it was a story until it happened. So that's a little different. Um, and because they're short, uh, yeah, you can kind of visualize how to frame the story, how to, how to build it. Uh, but that's a, that's a really good question because in fiction you can make all kinds of choices about how the book ends. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that later. Um, I made alternative endings. I say, well, what if I do it this way? What if I do it that way? Um, and I had a lot of time to think about that because the book kept getting rejected. Um, made me think more. Yeah. OK, maybe one more question. Well, I have a question. Yeah. If this group does read Ricochet River, would you recommend that they actually float the river to get the feel for it? Uh, let's see. What kind of, um, boom, what kind of timing do we have for that? Uh, we are starting in February, the end of February, and we will be finishing the book uh, mid-May. River's going to be pretty high. River's going to be pretty high, and I don't think we could get the... Uh, I don't want to take people... I don't know how well you swim and stuff like that, so I don't want to do it. Well, I meant for recommendation. <laughs> As a general recommendation, if you're a strong swimmer, take a life jacket. Uh, sure, uh, there are ways to do that river. You put in at 
Barton, uh, Barton Park, uh, and take out at Carver uh, is a good way to do it. A little bit longer trip is to put in at Carver and come down here to uh, Clackamet Park, right past High, Rock, High Rocks. You'll see on the week weekends there are lots and lots of people out there, too many, but, uh, but it's quite a float. But you really have to wait till July, August so that the river is a reasonable temperature, um, that it's down. Yeah, be careful. Yep. One more question, and then we're. Then, then, then I take a shower. <laughs> yes? Uh, what's the hardest part of writing a book? What to leave out is probably the hardest part because you have some, some things that you really you think is a pretty good paragraph or you think it's something really smart that Lorna said in, in Ricochet River, and, uh, but it doesn't fit the story. And so you have to, you write by subtraction. Each one of these stories was written probably twice as long as you read it. Uh, and it gets better by taking out the fat. Uh, so writing by subtraction <coughs> is something I had to learn, that it gets better if it's shorter. Um, and that was, that was the hardest part for me. It's very satisfying, though. I mean, it's not, it's not work when it goes well. It's work when you can't, when you're staring at a blank page or something like that, if you can't get your brain going. But most of the time, it's pretty satisfying. Um, yeah, Terry, take it. Well, we're going to wrap it up. So would you guys join me in giving Robin a round of applause? Thank you for being here. <laughs> you. I think it's such a treat to have the author of the book that we're reading come talk to us. And we always love your visit. So thank you so much for coming again. I like being here. It's my favorite place, my favorite class uh, school visit to do. And really this, is. this is a great group. These are all outdoor enthusiasts right yeah. here. So they hopefully enjoyed the stories as much as I know I did. And, and we, again, Well, that's what I like here. about it, too, yeah. that you guys, you guys are on it. Pretty good. Thank well, you. Thank you. Yeah.